and Father Robert Lauder. Uh, welcome to another session of the Catholic novel. Today we're going to talk about Mark Salzman's novel, Lying Awake. Now, I don't know the uh, background of Mark Salzman. I don't even know whether he's a Catholic or not. But if he is not a Catholic, it's some kind of a miracle that he wrote this novel. This is a terrific Catholic novel. And Salzman has been able to enter into a world which I presume <clears throat> is totally alien to him, a cloistered convent. And not only that, he's, he's, uh, as well as any other book I have ever read, he gets close to describing a mystical experience. So let me tell you, let me tell you the plot, and then I want to comment on a couple of things. It's the story of a nun cloistered in a convent who, when she enters, experiences, uh, I guess, the dark night of the soul. In other words, she doesn't feel anything toward God. Uh, she takes the names John of the Cross, and of course that's significant because St. John of the Cross experienced the dark night of the soul for 17 years. For 17 years he had no emotional reaction to God, though he continued to pray, he continued to be committed. If we take her diary uh, as an accurate report, Mother Teresa claimed she, she had the dark night of the soul for about 30 years. Now it's really... Uh, strange that when, when that became public, when the, the, her writing and her diary became public, she talked about all these dry years. One of the students I, had a, I was in a discussion group said, she should have told all of us why she was alive so we'd be able to, be able to understand it better. She misled us. Of course, of course she didn't mislead us. The fact that you experience the dark night of the soul does not mean you're a bad person. It doesn't even mean you're distant from God. It means you feel distant from God. And in a sense, uh, this may be a tremendous trial because if you feel distant from God, you can then jump to the conclusion that God doesn't love me, that I'm not important, and so on. But John of the Cross did not do that, and neither did uh, Mother Teresa, and neither did the uh, nun in this novel. John of the Cross, when she is a young child, is abandoned by her mother and brought up by her grandparents. Um, after she's in the convent a while, her mother gets in touch with her, and it's a very, very touching, very dramatic scene. The mother has all sorts of problems, uh, and she has remarried, and uh, she has a couple of children, and she, the whole reason she's visiting is not because she wants to make contact again with her daughter, but she doesn't want the daughter to write to her anymore because she doesn't want a new family to know that she had a previous family. So this is like a crushing experience for, for Sister John of the Cross. She finally has a reunion with her mother, and it turns out to be something completely pragmatic. Uh, now, let, let's go back to the, when Sir John of the Cross first enters the convent. She's really kind of uh, desperate. Uh, you know, she's doing all the, ser she's going to all the prayer service and so on, but why didn't she feel closer to God? Then after a number of years, she begins to have something like ecstatic illuminations, some, something like mystical experiences. Now, I'm going to now try to explain something that is inexplicable. What does that term, mystical experience, mean? Well, uh, if we had a group of people here and we asked them, what is their image of God? Someone might say, God is love, God is beauty, God is good, God is true, God is a father, God is a mother. God is my best friend. We might come up with many, many concepts, okay? And they might all be true. They might all be true. But none of them is adequate. What I mean is this. While we can speak truthfully about God, we cannot speak clearly about God. So everything I just said, God is true, God is beautiful, God is good, we must immediately add, not in the way we are. We are all those things in a finite way. God is all those things in an infinite way. So while we can speak truthfully, we can't speak clearly. So here's how, I, here's how I picture it. It's as though we've got a rubber band. And the particular concept we have, good, truth, beauty, whatever it happens to be, we shoot it off into the darkness at God. And it depicts God, but it depicts God in a very vague way. So let me, let me repeat myself. We can speak truthfully, but not clearly. Now my experience of, of, of even, even preaching a sermon of, of talking about God is something like this, and you have to, you'll have to examine your own consciences, your own experience on this. I would say I experienced a chiaroscuro. What I mean is this, a mixture of light and darkness. So every time I get an insight into the mystery of God, I simultaneously am aware that God is radical mystery. 
that I do not understand him completely. Even to say him is not completely accurate, okay? I do not understand God completely, and I never will. So the, the light enables me to see something I didn't see before, but at the same time, it calls my attention to the darkness, okay? Now, that's, the way, that's where most of us are. What happens with a mystic? As far as I can make out, a mystical experience is a supra-conceptual experience. By that I mean it goes beyond the ideas. Uh, how can I put it? The mystic somehow embraces God, or maybe even better, God somehow embraces the mystic. Or maybe, God, uh, maybe the mystic kisses God, or God kisses the mystic. Now I know all these terms uh, are, are not accurate, but we, we cannot explain a mystical experience, okay? But anyway, when mystics have experiences, they often write poetry, they sing songs, they dance, okay? Um, well, let, let, me, let me inject a, a humorous note. Suppose I, I say Mass every day at St. John's University. Suppose uh, two or three hours after the Mass is over, people are looking for me, they don't know where I am, and someone says, Father Lord is, is over in the church, he's kneeling on the floor, he's got his arms out like this, and let's imagine I'm having a mystical experience. So they call in NBC TV. Uh, the New York Times sends a couple of reporters over. Uh, the, the Father Robert Lloyd has been kneeling there for a couple of hours. Oh, wait, here he comes. Here he comes now. We'll, we'll ask him what happened. Father Lloyd, what happened? And I start, I start doing a tap dance, okay? Why? Because I can't tell anybody what happened. Something great has happened if you have a mystical experience. But words crumble now. Here's what happens to Sister John, Sister John of the Cross. As she, be, as she begins, whenever she has these experiences, she seems to be able to write great poetry. It's almost like this uh, illumination from God liberates her and frees her. So that uh, after she has one, she almost can't wait to get to a, a, a pencil and paper and write something down. And some of the poems win big prizes. So she's She's a very uh, nice addition to the, to the cloistered convent because the, pro the money prize that she wins helps to support the nuns. However, accompanying this experience of an ecstatic illumination from God are severe migraine headaches. And uh, the superior is very concerned about Sister John of the Cross's health. And the, the headaches prevent her from being part of the community. Uh, she, because when, if you've ever, if you've ever had, I, thank, thank God, I've never had a migraine headache. But if you have ever had one, you know they're devastating. When I was in the seminary, a classmate of mine had them with some regularity, and all he could do was go to bed. He would just, he would just close his door, go to bed, and a day or two later, he would come out, and he would have these gigantic black rings under his uh, eyes. People have described it to me different ways. It's like someone's crushing your head. Uh, it, it makes you sick all over. Okay. So the superior insists that John of the Cross goes to a doctor and investigates this. She goes to a doctor, she meets a young doctor, and very quickly he says, these experiences you are having are epileptic. You have a small tumor behind one of your ears. Uh, it can be operated on, it's not a big operation, and, and that should, rem that should, prevent, that should uh, do away with the migraine headaches, however, they may also, it may also do away with these ecstatic illuminations from God. So now Sister John of the Cross has a decision to make. After all those years of a dark night of the soul, she does not want to give up these experiences she thinks she's having of God. Um, I mean, they, they, they now make her, her, her experience in the cloister bearable. And, and she, be, she has believed that they're, they're coming from God not from a, a small tumor behind her ear, okay? So she's got to make this decision, and she does make the decision. She goes and she has the operation, and the, uh, the tumor is removed, and, so, and the ecstatic illumination stop. She's very, very frightened that she will slip back into another dark night of the soul. Uh, but that, that does not happen. She's not having the illuminations, but she continues to live uh, as a good cloistered nun. So this, this novel, I think, raises all sorts of ideas, uh, all sorts of questions about holiness. The novel has a really nice ending. A new uh, young lady has entered the convent, and she, it looks like she's going to need special attention. So the mother superior, who comes across as a really wise woman, 
says to Sir John of the Cross, I want you to be her supervisor. I want you to be the one who takes her through, the, through life in the convent and through the vows. John of the Cross realizes this is a big, big obligation, okay? And she feels extremely unworthy. But my reading of the novel is she has reached a new level of holiness. So let me, let me tell you what I think and then read, you read the novel. It's a, it's, a, it's a relatively short novel. Read the novel and see what you think. Was the, were those experiences, those ecstatic illuminations of God? It seems to me maybe they were. Maybe they were caused, or let me put it this way, maybe God used the tumor to allow this nun to have an experience of God. But that seems to me to be quite possible, as God might use someone's personality or someone's talent in preaching, uh, someone's talent with the television camera, okay? So maybe that's it. So in other words, I, I hesitate to say all of those experiences were a waste of time. They had nothing to do with God. I can't say that, and I don't know how anybody could. I mean, how do we know how God deals with people? So I think the, as wonderful as, this, as Sister John of the Cross thought the illuminations were, she's now, in my opinion, at a deeper level of holiness. She's living the cloistered life without the illuminations. I mean, the illuminations were, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to be crass here, but the illuminations were kind of a candy, you know? Uh, it, it made everything wonderful. It, you, you had the feeling you were, I imagine she was tempted to feel she was somehow superior, or at least that God had chosen her among all these other nuns and so on. But all that, that's all gone now. So what has she got? She's got her vows. She's got silence. She's got this tremendous task and job that the Mother Superior has given her. Take care of this young nun. Uh, you're the one who can lead her into a deeper, deeper uh, life with God. She's got all that. And of course, she's also got God. I mean, because the illuminations have left, that doesn't mean God has left her life. And this is why I think it's, if Mark Salzman, I hope someday I meet him or interview him or read an interview with him, if he is not a Catholic, it's really a kind of literary miracle that he could write this book. Uh, the, the best descriptions of myst mystical experiences I have ever read in any novel. I think the ones in Marriott and Ecstasy are good too. Uh, Ron Hansen's Marriott and Ecstasy. But these are really uh, phenomenal. Um, and also, uh, every section of the book has uh, the name of the saint whose, whose feast day it is. And uh, you, so you could, if you wanted to, do a little bit of research there. Why, why is today St. Ignatius? Why is today St. Teresa? Now, I want, to, I want to read just two sentences. I think they're both, uh, the first one I think is rather humorous, right? The first one is this. The real penance in cloistered life, most sisters agreed, was night is isolation. It was the impossibility of getting away from people one would not normally have chosen as friends. <laughs> I think that's very funny. Anybody in community life will tell you that, okay? Uh, you know, you spend all your time with people you would not have chosen. And then the, the other one is this. They're talking about St. Teresa of Lisieux's Little Flowers autobiography. The message of the book was simple. We needn't fear God or feel that we must do exceptional things to please him because he loves the humblest soul as much as he loves the greatest saint. And maybe that is the message of this novel. I strongly recommend it. It's a terrific novel. Mm -hmm.